Caffeine on Deck, and uh, we're joined here with uh, Patrick Krupa, uh, the Chief Psychedelic Officer of Better Life Pharma and an overall pretty cool dude. Uh, Patrick, thank you for joining us and starting off the Ibogaine Conference with a keynote here. Uh, thank you very much for, for having me. It's uh, It's been a very long and strange trip to get to this point with uh, with Ibogaine, and it's uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. So, how long uh, how long has your journey in the Ibogaine field been? When did you originally get started? Well, I mean, I started in the Stone Ages back in the 1990s, and uh, I, I started out. You know, the first time I ever heard of Ibogaine, I was literally a teenager, and we were at these uh, these hacker meetings that were taking place on the Lower East Side, and it was sort of last gas for this thing called the Technological Assistance Program, which was started by Abby Hoffman, and that was you know Howard Lotsoff. Dana Beal, the, the original crew of people who discovered sort of what Ibogaine does and uh, the neat effects that it had. So it was always like this thing that I had heard about since I was very young. And uh, during the 1990s, uh, we started the first internet access provider in New York City called Mindvox. And and so I'm like 22 years old. Everything in my life is awesome. My dreams are coming true. Here comes dot com. Here comes the internet. And I was a high functioning addict. I was addicted to heroin the whole time. And that was a lot of fun until it wasn't. And the problem is at that point, you discover just there, there's no exit. Nothing works. I had a you know, I tried literally everything. And to make a really long story very short, uh, I began did work for me. And, uh, you know, back in the 90s, there were fewer than uh, 1,000 people worldwide who had ever been treated with Ibogaine other than, you know, indigenous people in Gabon and Cameroon who were using it as, you know, rite of passage initiation ceremonies. They weren't using it to reset habits. And that's how I ended up working with Ibogaine during uh, the very late 90s, early 2000s. That's incredible. And uh, since then, you know, it's, it's definitely increased in popularity, I guess you could say, or just, you know, mass, mass cultural adoption. How many people by now do you think have been treated by Ibogaine for similar afflictions? <laughs> it's really, really hard to say. I mean, it's, you know, do Dr. Ken Alper wrote a paper back in the, the 2000s and the speed was picking up exponentially and it's where orders of magnitude that I mean the worldwide awareness that I began exists has amplified tremendously. There's uh, you know, we're like three generations of people past that point in time. And uh, you know, Howard who was an amazing human being, you know, he passed away in, in 2010 and I think he would have been very excited because his dream was always medicalization, bringing Ibogaine to as many people as humanly possible. And that seems to be in the process of happening right now. Beautiful. Um, who is your Ibogaine hero? Who's the person you look up to in the, uh, in the Ibogaine world? Or people. <laughs> my, my Ibogaine hero, well, that, that would be Deborah Mash because she's the single individual who, you know, not only detoxed me, but it's enabled me to save my own life. I mean, I had a very low bottom. I was doing, uh, two, I was on 200 megs of methadone per day and I was doing about a gram and a half to two grams of heroin on top of that. It's hard to say if it's a gram and a half or two grams because there are all those quality control issues with the black market. You can't get GMP heroin, which is one of the problems with it. But I was pretty close to being dead. And, uh, you know, I began to provide a reboot. And then, you know, after that, I got pulled into a completely different life in a very enriched environment. And suddenly I'm at the Department of Neurology and I'm uh, d dismantling brains and working with the human supercomputer and it was it, it, it was just okay here's a brand new life and it 
it changed the the path of that I was on completely. So that that would be Deborah, who's here with us. Yeah, yeah, and we're we're excited to uh, have a keynote from uh, Dr. Deborah later on today. Um, and, you know, really thrilled to have you here and just, you know, an all-star cast of speakers and uh, really excited to get this going. So I'm, I'm not going to hog up too much uh, time on the mic here. I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, join us and I'll, I'll shoo myself off backstage and let you get into the, uh, the good stuff with your keynote here. Thanks so much for joining us, Patrick. Th thanks for having me, Patrick. <laughs> Hey, hello. It's uh, it's a pleasure to, to be here, albeit it's very, very early. And uh, wh whoever is awake and, and watching all of this, it's uh, been a very long, uh, surreal sort of trip from the, the 1990s to where we're at right now in, uh, in 2021. And uh, I guess the new normal is what we're all doing right now, because usually I began conferences is, uh, you know, a lot of rooms with a lot of people all hanging out together and uh w welcome to the new reality but as, as as we talked about in the intro i mean my intersection with ibogaine at the very beginning was as a drug dependent individual who needed help and who could not get off of opioids i uh tried literally every detox methodology, every paradigm, every treatment that existed like back in the 90s. I mean, I didn't have a lack of funding. I didn't have a lack of access to professionals. I was living in New York City. And, uh, you know, to make, to compress it down and make it shorter, I just nothing at all worked. I was on, you know, methadone maintenance for years and years of my time. I was on methadone tapers where, you know, you titrate down towards nothing and step out of it. I did ultra rapid opioid detox twice. It didn't accomplish much of anything. It's like, okay, you're clean, but you're clean and you feel terrible. You're just sick. And the only thing you can think about is getting straight. And so then you do. I was on the very early clinical trials for uh, buprenorphine, where they were trying to uh, make it bioavailable sublingually, which they succeeded with. That became Subutex and Suboxone, and that was under the auspices of Dr. Richard Resnick at, uh, at Columbia. And he was actually a really phenomenal doctor. I mean, he was a good guy. There, there's people in addiction treatment who are just not very wonderful people you know richard resnick was was a great guy he tried to help everybody and you know he'd go in his office and there's a signed photo of uh pete pete townsend and there's eric clapton he did not mount keith richard's photo that was not that didn't make him happy. but he had this thing called the tens unit which was like electronic acupuncture and it was incredibly hot at that point in time during the 90s and you know, I tried that. That didn't work. I was basically moving outwards, trying to find different experimental treatments. And uh, in addition to I like since my very early teens, I had one of those toxic childhoods that is so popular. And it, parts of it were a lot of fun. I mean, it was like this intersection of a lot of different worlds all colliding together. His own health issues at the time. And one of his partners named Bob Sisko turned me on to this, uh, this person named uh, Dr. Deborah Mash, who was working with Ibogaine at the University of Miami. And you're on, and as I, as I think I summed up, when, when this whole thing began, I was on about 200 megs of methadone and doing, you know, a gram and a half to two grams of heroin on top of that. And so all that you're experiencing at that moment in time is pain. It feels like your bones are being smashed. It feels like your spine is being crushed in a vice. You have hot flashes, cold flashes. You feel terrible because your endogenous uh, endorphin production is completely shut down because you keep introducing exogenous molecules into your bloodstream and attaching them to your receptors. I mean, you're going through withdrawal. 
and uh, I was given Ibogaine. And what, what happens within about 30 to 45 minutes, it feels like And it's very slowly coiling up your spine. And as it moves upwards, all of the pain is just letting go. And it feels like being suspended in this ocean of warm energy. And that, that moment right there is the closest thing I have ever experienced to a miracle because it's like, okay, here's a sickness that I've tried to get rid of for 10 years. I mean, I've been trying to get up though forever. Nothing ever worked. This just did. And as far as we know, this is impossible. This can't possibly be doing what it just did. And then you get really busy because you're tripping for the next uh, six to eight hours. And uh, as, you, as you reintegrate and come back down to earth, you kind of discover that, you know, your habits stayed lost in inner space. It didn't come back down with you. And that is absolutely phenomenal and completely unique within all of psychedelics. There's nothing else that does that. I mean, you can do LSD when you're strung out on heroin. I have many times. You can do psilocybin. You can do whatever. And you can gain the most profound insights into your addiction, your psychology. Why are you in the state that you're in right now? And as you're gliding back down to earth, unfortunately, what you discover is, you know, habit is deception. The light is a hallucination and your body is a prison cell because your habit is alive and well. It's still with you and you got to go get another fix. I began non-exist your habit. And the interesting thing is, I mean, this whole story sort of started to gain momentum with Howard Lotsoff's anecdotal observations in 1962. And it would have to be a drug dependent individual in order to make that observation, because if you aren't addicted to opiates, then you never know that it gets rid of your habit when you come back down from Ibogaine because you don't have a habit. I mean, there's uh, a lot of evidence that uh, the CIA under the auspices of uh, Isabel Harris at the you know, Happy Fun Lexington Narcotics Farm was busy dosing prisoners with Ibogaine before that. And there's, uh, there's you know, SIBO Pharmaceuticals I believe went into Novartis to the best of my knowledge. Uh, they were doing some research with uh, with Ibogaine in the 50s and antihypertensive, but none of their findings were ever really published beyond some very early indications. So, you know, Howard basically kicked open the gates and Ibogaine treatment started happening during the late 70s, early 80s. By the time it was the 90s, it was kind of like shutting down. But people were getting treated on the Lower East Side of New York City. That's sort of the birthplace of, of Ibogaine. And, you know, the Lower East Side is gone. If you go through all of these places in time, it's like everything has been raised and condos have gone up. It's just like it doesn't exist anymore except in your memories and some videos on YouTube. But uh, the really amazing thing that happened was uh, Howard Lotsoff uh, pushed for medicalization of Ibogaine from the very beginning. He uh, was issued a series of patents for Ibogaine versus polysubstance abuse disorders. He formed a company. He knocked on everybody's door trying to get their attention that, hey, this works. And I think one of the only individuals that really listened to him was uh, Dr. Deborah Mash at the, the University of Miami. And during the 90s, she accomplished what was essentially impossible. She got the FDA to move. The FDA 
green-lighted phase one clinical trials on Ibogaine on uh, human drug-dependent subjects within the United States.